The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the rapid collapse of communist regimes throughout Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union surprised most Western scholars and Soviet experts. For some, however, it confirmed what they had suspected all along, that communism was a vision of society ultimately doomed to failure. One thinker in particular had spent a lifetime trying to show why communism couldn't work and why trying to force it to work would prove disastrous. Before he was finally vindicated, Friedrich August von Hayek was dismissed, ridiculed, and ignored. Yet, in the end, even defenders of socialism came to concede that he was right. To a remarkable degree, Hayek's personal and professional fortunes and the intellectual battles in which he found himself are also the story of the 20th century. In his 25 books and hundreds of articles, Hayek articulated an elaborate and inspiring vision of the free society. His insights continue to shape how we think about the social and economic problems of our time. Liberty Fund proudly presents a profile in liberty, the life and thought of Friedrich August von Hayek. Descended from Austrian nobility, Friedrich August von Hayek was born in 1899 in Vienna, the heart of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and one of the leading intellectual capitals of Europe. Hayek's parents were deeply enmeshed in that world. His father was a doctor and an eminent botanist. His maternal grandfather had served as president of Austria's statistical commission. Hayek's two brothers would both become professors and physical scientists, Hans in anatomy and Eric in chemistry. His cousin Ludwig Wittgenstein would become famous as a philosopher. Hayek's first intellectual interest was in the sciences, especially botany. As a child, he helped his father categorize alpine plants. In addition to scientific pursuits, he took up photography in the theater and physical interests such as skiing, sailing, and mountain climbing. In his teens, Hayek turned to the study of human learning and behavior, and for a time he considered becoming a psychiatrist. In June 1914, a single occurrence set in motion a series of events that would recast the world and the life of young Hayek. Archduke Ferdinand of Austro-Hungary was assassinated, setting the stage for the war to end all wars. World War I's effects were devastating to the old order. The long-standing Austro-Hungarian dynasty of the Habsburgs was out of power. In Russia, the Romanov dynasty had been destroyed, and communism was the new social order. Hayek, like many young Europeans after the war, was drawn to socialism. For Hayek, the appeal of socialism lay in its attempt to solve social ills by applying scientific principles to government planning and control of the economy. Hayek was pulled towards the Fabian variety of socialism, which favored peaceful, gradual government interventions rather than the sweeping and violent revolutions advocated by Marxist socialists. I never got captured by Marxist socialism, on the contrary. Then I counted socialism in its Marxist, frightfully doctrinaire form, and the Vienna socialists, Marxists, were more doctrinaire than most other places. It rather repelled me. Hayek entered the University of Vienna, a major center of intellectual activity. The war had created poor material conditions, but the school was still a vibrant and exciting place. It was here at the university that Hayek was first introduced to the Austrian School of Economics, this group of scholars extended the insights of the 18th century economist Adam Smith regarding the workings of a free market economy. In his classic work, The Wealth of Nations, 
Smith had sought to explain the tremendous growth in commerce that had taken place in the West during the 17th and 18th centuries. In opposition to the dominant views of his day, Smith saw that a prosperous economy arises not from the actions of governments, but through the voluntary actions of buyers and sellers in the marketplace. In Smith's understanding, no one person or group dictates what the supply and demand of goods will be. Rather, each person acts in his or her own interest. As long as exchanges are allowed to be free and voluntary, neither buyer nor seller will trade unless they both stand to gain from the transaction. According to Smith, the ultimate consequence of all these various exchanges is a flourishing and orderly economy. Adam Smith was also the first to point out the fundamental importance of the division of labor as part of a prosperous economy. Through division of labor, the particular knowledge and skills of individual men and women contribute to the creation of a vast number of goods. This insight continues to be of central importance to our understanding of a well-ordered society. Smith's insights were extended by the Austrian school economists, beginning with the publication of Karl Menger's path-breaking book, Principles of Economics. The central point of Menger's work, which was published in 1871, was that the value of any given product is determined not by the amount of labor that went into making it, or by the costs of production, but by the individual desires of the buyer and of the seller. Each consumer determines how much of his property he is willing to give in exchange for someone else's product or service. Likewise, each producer determines how much he or she will accept for their product or service. Trade will only take place if it benefits both parties in an exchange. And only those individuals involved in the exchange have complete knowledge of the benefits they seek and what they are willing to give in exchange. This emphasis on the individual and subjective nature of economic information, which was begun by Menger and continued by the Austrian school economists, would prove to be the bedrock of Hayek's own work. The Austrian school convinced Hayek that there can be order, such as the order that exists in markets without a centralized designer. This idea opened the door to his own insights regarding spontaneous order, the division of knowledge, and the role of prices in conveying vital information and the rule of law. These ideas would set him on a collision course with the dominant political trends of the 20th century. In 1921, Hayek received his doctorate in law and two years later was granted a doctorate in political economy. While at the University of Vienna, he had studied philosophy, law, and economics. It was shortly after taking his formal degree in political economy that Hayek met Ludwig von Mises for the first time. Mises was director of the Austrian Chamber of Industry and one of the leaders of the Austrian school's second generation of scholars. He would have a deep influence on Hayek's work. So he came to him with a letter of introduction by von Wiese, who was my little teacher, who described him as a promising economist. Me is looking me. Promising economist? I've never seen you at my lectures. <laughs> <laughs> but we became, became very great friends afterwards. Mises' book, Socialism, had a significant impact on Hayek's economic thought. In it, Mises attempted to show that in economic terms, a socialist state was technically impossible. Mises argued that since socialism denied a system of voluntary exchanges, the relative prices that provided signals for decision-making were missing. Without these signals, coordination of activities within the economy is impossible. In 1924, Hayek began attending Mises's private seminars. These events were considered the center of economic debate in Vienna. If I had come to him as a young student, I would probably have just swallowed his views completely. As it, is, I, as it was, I came to him already with a degree. I had finished my elementary course, so I approached him in a slightly more critical fashion. 
and uh, being for ten years in close contact with a man with whom conclusions you on the whole agreed, but whose arguments were not always perfectly convincing to you, was a great stimulus. In 1927, Hayek and Mises co-founded the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research. The board included prominent economists. Young Hayek, the Institute's director, was beginning to solidify his reputation as a world-class economist. In 1929, Hayek began his first teaching position at the University of Vienna. That year also saw the publication of his first book, Monetary Theory and the Trade Cycle. In this work, Hayek expanded on the Austrian school's theories by developing the idea that the prices of goods and services, including interest rates, are information signals which are vital to the independent plans of consumers and producers. The main point of Hayek's book was that usually these information signals make possible harmonious and spontaneous overall adjustments within the economy. However, government intervention in the economy can cause false or distorted signals, which can ultimately lead to economic ruin. The core of the argument was simple. In a well-ordered economy, prices convey knowledge, and for the economy to function properly, that knowledge must not be distorted by government intervention. This basic idea would set Hayek in direct confrontation with two major trends in economic thinking, socialism and Keynesianism. For Hayek, economic knowledge is dispersed among individuals. This division of knowledge, as it would later be called, makes the central planning desired by socialists impossible. If prices are a way of coordinating the plans of individuals, and those plans can only be known by those individuals, then any order provided by central planning would simply be arbitrary and most likely destructive to economic prosperity. Hayek's insights were also directly at odds with government policies designed to enhance consumption, either through monetary inflation or through government spending. These policies were the very heart of John Maynard Keynes' more moderate interventionism. With his first book, Hayek had rebuffed the two most dominant trends in economic thought. In England, Hayek had come to the attention of Lionel Robbins, who was soon to head the prestigious London School of Economics, or LSE. The LSE was looking for someone intellectually capable of taking on John Maynard Keynes at the University of Cambridge. Robbins invited Hayek to come to England and give a series of four lectures. Hayek literally swept the audience off its feet and he put forward a view of the Great Depression that seemed to be both accurate and complete. Hayek was invited to become a professor at the LSE and in 1931 he and his family moved to London. Soon Hayek and Robbins, by now a good friend, were emulating Mises by holding their own private seminars. These lively gatherings attracted many international economists. It was during his time at the LSE that Hayek laid down the basis for his larger theory of spontaneous order. Working out the implications of his idea that prices are information signals, he began to extend this insight to the workings of society in general. It is the idea that there can be great orderliness in a society even though there is no one doing the ordering. To achieve this orderliness, however, it was essential that prices be allowed to fluctuate without interference. Societies cannot be organized without the signals that come through a free enterprise system using prices and profits. Hayek thought that prices and profits primarily convey information. Hayek's theory of information or knowledge was groundbreaking. A market is a system of the utilization of knowledge, uh, which nobody can possess as a whole, which only through the market situation leads people to aim at the needs of people whom they do not know, make use of facilities of which they have no direct information, all this condensed in abstract signals, and that 
our whole situation, our whole modern wealth and production could arise only thanks to this mechanism, is, I believe, the basis not only of my economic but as much of my political views. His um, most important contribution is to extend the paradigm or idea of Adam Smith about uh, division of labor and making it into division of knowledge. You need the market because you need a way in which people can, can benefit, can capitalize on what they know that's different from other people. And, in the, con and in, the, in the course of this capitalizing on their specialized knowledge, they share this knowledge with other people. This linking of the dispersed nature of knowledge with the theory of spontaneous order lay at the core of Hayek's distrust of central planning. In his view, no central planner could gather together enough knowledge to create the same order and richness that occurs spontaneously in a free market. If production had been directed by a central planning agency, would they have directed in the internet technology which is so revolutionizing human life? Hayek argued that central planning authorities don't develop that sort of planning ability, that they're inevitably bureaucratic and they prevent the new and the creative and the diverse from emerging, and that what you want to do is have a society in which individuals are free to do as much as what they want, whatever they want to do, as long as they're not physically harming someone else. To Hayek, central control over individual economic decisions leads inevitably to control over what individuals are allowed to do and the ideas they are allowed to develop. He placed a beautiful quote at the beginning of every chapter of The Road to Serfdom. And there is a quote by Belloc he placed at the beginning of a chapter, where he says, let me see if memory serves, the control of the production of wealth is the control of human life itself. These insights led Hayek into a prolonged debate with the socialist thinkers of his day, a complicated dialogue that became known as the socialist calculation debate. On his side, Hayek extended Mises' earlier argument that socialism was technically impossible. Both Hayek and Mises' great accomplishment was to turn the question of socialism from a moral question to a practical question. It wasn't whether individuals are good enough for socialism. It's a question of whether or not socialism can practically be the way a society can be organized. Hayek argued that without freely adjusting prices based in private property, there were no signals for socialist planners to use in calculating the relative values of goods and services, and there was no information for deciding which production methods were most efficient. But scholars influenced by socialist ideas were not persuaded by the arguments of Hayek or Mises. Perhaps the most vocal critic of the Austrian school was Oskar Lange, a prominent Polish socialist. According to Lange, Mises had provided a service to the socialists by pointing out the need for a more careful system of economic accounting that would guide production resources in a socialist economy. Rather than pointing out the impossibility of socialist calculation, said Lange, the Austrians had merely pointed to a problem that socialist thinkers could certainly solve. The socialists always operated and still do uh, as if intellectual elites can uh, govern uh, society from above. And uh, what Oscar Lange did, for example, was only to switch the elite from, say, kings and emperors and others, benevolent despots of uh, days past, into the enlightened uh, economists that could run and operate the economy from above. Despite having missed the real point of Hayek's criticism, Longa's arguments were persuasive with both academics and the general public. Public opinion was firmly on the side of more government control over economic life and firmly against Hayek's ideas. Equally formidable in the arena of both academic and political opinion would be the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. Rather than advocating the complete nationalization of the economy, as the socialists did, 
Keynes and his followers contended that the government should stimulate economic growth through monetary inflation and through spending on public projects. This ran directly counter to Hayek's contention that government intervention distorts the information conveyed by prices. Hayek argued that although under Keynes' approach, there may be indeed short-term stimulation of the economy, prices will no longer transmit accurate information between producers and consumers. This would result in the wrong things being produced in the wrong quantities at the wrong time, or what Austrian school economists refer to as malinvestment. The debate between Hayek and Keynes would continue until Keynes' death at the age of 63 in 1946, and it was a debate that, at the time, Hayek appeared to lose decisively. Beginning in the early 1930s, Keynes and Hayek sparred publicly on how to break the Great Depression that held the world in its grip. A central issue was what role the government should play in attempting to increase employment and stabilize the economy. For Hayek, it was a matter of letting the system, which had been actively discoordinated through government inflation of the money supply, recover naturally. Artificial intervention only postponed and aggravated the necessary correction. Keynes vehemently disagreed. Keynes's view was that now it was the purpose of government to get the economy rolling again, to prime the pump, for there to be government work projects, for there to be government transfer payments, whatever could be done to get the economy moving again. Underlying these disputes was another point of disagreement between these two great thinkers. Hayek concentrated on individual transactions between buyers and sellers. Keynes, however, argued that the important figures were economic aggregates, such as total unemployment and gross national product. Hayek held that aggregate figures only hide important economic information, which is necessarily individualized and dispersed. Hayek reviewed Keynes's treatise on money, which had just coming out, just slamming it. And then Keynes responded with a review of Hayek's own book, Prices and Production, which Keynes thoroughly demolished. In the Keynes debate, as in the socialist calculation debate, Hayek pressed the notion that government economic planning was inherently doomed by the knowledge problem. No bureaucrat or central planner could ever possess enough knowledge of individual needs to design an efficiently functioning and prospering economy. For Hayek, the myriad calculations government planners would require in order to address a situation made complete and current knowledge unachievable. In addition, and perhaps more important, the kinds of information necessary for successful planning are impossible to centralize. This information consists of non-scientific, personal, particular knowledge, or what Hayek called knowledge of time and place. His alternative was the spontaneous order of a free market, which efficiently and accurately made these calculations every day. What happens in a modern society is the absolutely unpredictable result of um, millions of individual decisions going on all the time. I think that's a very interesting idea, and it's powerful because it's so counterintuitive. The Hayek-Keynes debate took a decisive turn in 1936 with the publication of Keynes' famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. This work, one of the most influential books on economic policy in the 20th century, defined Keynes' attack on classical liberal economics. But despite its significance, Hayek did not mount a public counterattack. He thought that Keynes' latest theory would not succeed, and he knew of Keynes' habit of frequently changing his mind. Hayek would later admit that his failure to publicly respond to the general theory was a serious miscalculation. He would not get another opportunity to publicly debate Keynes on these issues. The greatest boost to Keynes' theories came in America, where voters turned out the staid Hoover for the dynamic Roosevelt. 
Roosevelt initially gave Keynes' ideas half-hearted support, still hoping to balance America's budget. But with the economic situation worsening, FDR embraced Keynes' ideas and dramatically expanded the role of government in American life. The late 1930s and early 1940s were difficult times for Hayek. In addition to losing the popular verdict on his ideas, Hayek watched as the clouds of major conflict gathered across Europe. One of the most horrific social forces of the century was about to plunge the world into its second global war. Hayek was especially frustrated by what he saw as his colleagues' misperception of what was unfolding. External circumstances of environment made it necessary for me to explain to my English colleagues who firmly believed that the bad German capitalists had started a reaction against the promising socialist developments, that they were wrong in their interpretation of the Hitler movement. An outspoken opponent of the Nazis, Hayek charged that the evils of National Socialism were of the same variety as the errors of Marxist Socialism. They resulted from the negation of liberty and the dehumanization of those who did not fit the bureaucrats' preconceived idea of what society should look like. Fascism was not, as the Marxists and leftists tried to assert, the result of capitalism. It was its very antithesis. Hayek's deep concern about the events of his time were leading him to apply his ideas to a broader social context. World War II had the effect of changing Hayek's focus of interest. And whereas during the 1930s he had been primarily a technical economist, participating in the technical economic debates of the day, from the 1940s onward in his career, and he lived until 1992, so that's a half century, he basically moved into the area of social philosophy. And I think that it's here that his greatest contributions were. In 1944, Hayek was made a fellow of the British Academy. That same year, a pivotal event would again propel Hayek onto the international stage, the publication in England of his most famous book. The Road to Serfdom. This was a hugely popular broadside in which Hayek made the claim that even mild government intervention could ultimately lead to a totalitarian state. Hayek had grave concerns about communism and Russia's role in the world, but he was also targeting socialism closer to home. There was quite a bit of central planning at that time. In fact, that's what the Labour government, the Labour government came in mm -hmm. immediately after the, the end of the, of, the, uh, of the European war, the war against Hitler. And uh, that's what they wanted to do. They yeah. wanted to introduce a, a form of socialism. Hayek's thesis in The Road to Serfdom was simple enough. Even piecemeal planning leads to unintended consequences that require even more planning and eventually can lead to attempts at central planning and totalitarianism. Government errors would be compounded when the same planners who made them then tried to set them right, leading to even more government intervention. Ultimately, the people in a society would be made to fit the bureaucrats' plan rather than the other way around. If a government goes wrong and enforces mm -hmm. the mistake it has made, there's no automatic correction of any kind. He made it crystal clear to anybody who, who was willing to open up their minds that you couldn't possibly gather enough information in a central bureau to direct a vastly complex economic system. You can barely do it for a simple village economy, but at least there, there wouldn't be egregious errors. Even well-intentioned states would eventually claim the power to make any decision necessary for the state's well-being. And since morality would at some point be sacrificed to state effectiveness, those who found it easy to make such trade-offs would ultimately rise to the top. This further endangered liberty. I think people went in the West. Uh, don't understand this point well because they, they thought they have already got the, the worst politicians. 
in the world. But if they live on the China, they will really know how, or inform severe children, how the real worst get on the top. Reaction to the road to serfdom was swift on both sides of the fence. One lecturer told an American audience that Hayek's statement about state intervention leading inevitably to totalitarianism was so obviously untrue that Hayek could not really have meant it. Many others expressed a different view. One Washington Post writer has since suggested that the book was the first shot in the intellectual battle that would turn the tide in favor of conservatism, and many believe it had the ultimate effect Hayek hoped to accomplish. The road to serfdom was not a prediction, it was a warning. It uh, was a warning that uh, if we embarked on a certain road, there would be unintended consequences. The Road to Serfdom has been published in more than 15 languages and has been in active print somewhere in the world since 1944. Although banned behind the Iron Curtain, numerous typewritten copies were in constant circulation. In countries where liberty is not the norm, Hayek's warnings were especially poignant. Both Hayek and his critics have, ne have never living under a serfdom a totalitarian regime, but Hayek has a much better understanding of this, of this kind of society that he never lived under. The book's popularity proved both a blessing and a curse. It did get Hayek's message out, as large numbers of the road to serfdom were sold during a frenzied book tour in America. Hayek became genuinely famous in both the United States and Great Britain as a result of the road to serfdom, and he became known as the most prominent classical liberal or libertarian-oriented intellectual or scholar in the world. But the enormous popular appeal of the road to serfdom masked a widely held academic disdain for its author. He had dared to disagree with the prevailing confidence of academics in socialism. And I think that was one of his outstanding characteristics, was that he was willing to take unpopular views and persevere with them, even when he would be ridiculed and criticized by his colleagues and peers for doing so. I think it's probably one of the best examples of well-reasoned argumentation I've seen in, you know, in, in the 20th century, but it was considered unscientific polemic. He'd had such a rough handling. I mean, he was not widely uh, welcomed. Uh, I would ask academics to meet him, and some would do so, but some academics, academics would say, I'm not, I don't want to meet that man. Hayek had known that he would suffer as the result of writing the book. It came in America just at the end of the great enthusiasm for the New Deal. And it was treated, even by the academic community, very largely as a malicious effort by a reactionary to destroy high ideals. With the result that my reputation was down to bottom, even among the academics. Labor was elected overwhelmingly in the general elections of 1945 and proceeded to move in exactly the opposite direction to that which Hayek had recommended. Many industries were nationalized, a vast welfare state was established. On the world stage, free market ideas were rapidly losing ground to Keynesian theories. This was in part the result of the popular perception that economic planning during the war had successfully mobilized resources and could do so in times of peace. Hayek, however, argued that equating a peacetime economy with wartime planning was a fundamental error. But the tide of academic opinion was solidly against him. Hayek recognized the need to preserve the ideas of classical liberalism. So he decided to create an international society of scholars to encourage renewed exploration into the political, economic, and cultural foundations of a free society. This gathering became known as the Mount Pelerin Society. Hayek uh, felt like uh, that the whole world was going socialist in uh, immediately after World War II, and he felt like there was a desperate need to to at least establish some connections between those who still held classical liberal notions 
And so he got the Montpelier Society organized in 1947. Hayek, through this grand assembly or gathering, overcame the isolation of individuals and united liberal scholars from history, political science, economics and philosophy, all of whom felt motivated to defend the free society. In 1947, the group met in a small town in the Swiss Alps. The first conference lasted 10 days. That first meeting, and the larger one that followed it in 1949, brought together intellectuals from a world still devastated by the recent war. This meeting was the first time that Germans had met with Americans since the war. That some Hollanders, Netherlands people had met with Germans since they'd been in concentration camps. There were many emotional events or scenes that took place. Hayek served as president of the Mont Pelerin Society until 1960, then as honorary president until his death. His vision of an ongoing formal gathering of like-minded intellectuals was realized. In 1955, Anthony Fisher, whom Hayek had met almost 10 years before, asked Hayek for advice on how to affect change in the direction of increased freedom. Hayek said to him that he should emphasize ideas, that ideas were far more important than pr practical political activity. Hayek famously said, keep out of politics. That was Fisher's idea. Fisher's idea was to get into politics and change things. Government were corrupt. I have uh, observed that some of my bad, best friends who, as a result of the war, got tied up in government work, and they've ever since been statesmen rather than scholars. As the result of his conversations with Hayek, Fisher founded the Institute of Economic Affairs in Britain. Fisher wasn't certainly an intellectual. I mean, he was a, a simple, really was a basic uh, practical farmer, you know, with dirt under his nails and all that kind of stuff. And so he eventually got round to meeting me and a few others, and. Um, putting up a small sum of money to get the IEA started. I mean, we were a, a child of Hayek, absolutely. Hayek believed that resources should support education. The Institute for Economic Affairs would be the first of many international think tanks inspired by Hayek. Organizations devoted to research and publishing on liberty and free market economics. In 1950, the University of Chicago offered Hayek an appointment to the prestigious Committee on Social Thought, which he accepted. Once again, he found himself in one of the centers of economic thought. One of the really interesting things about Hayek is that he was at the University of Vienna, he was at the London School of Economics, he was at the University of Chicago, all tremendously vital places intellectually. The University of Chicago had taken the risk of first publishing The Road to Serfdom in America, and it was considered a center for free market thought. The school was also located in a country considered a bulwark in the effort to contain communism. The move to Chicago was a good one for Hayek. His appointment to the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago enabled him to cut back his teaching and to do research in areas other than economics. He sometimes commented that an economist who only knows economics really doesn't know very much. He had much more of a holistic approach to knowledge and one that tried to bring together thoughts from a number of disciplines. I announced in Chicago a seminar on scientific method, in particular differences between international and social sciences. And it attracted some of the most distinguished members of the faculty of Chicago. At Enrico Fermi and mm. Sewell Wright and a few people of that quality sitting in my seminar discussing the scientific method. And that was one of the most exciting experiences of my life. The years in Chicago were productive. In 1952, Hayek published a book on knowledge and the mind, entitled The Sensory Order. After I'd published The Route to Serfdom in 1944, 
I wanted to take leave from this sort of subject. I so discredited myself with my professional colleagues by writing that book that I thought I would do something quite different and return to my psychological ideas. In the sensory order, as in Hayek's social and economic thought, multiple and dispersed connections make the system work. Information is spontaneously ordered through specific signals, and trial and error learning is an important basis for the brain's performance. Not only are people's brains different, we process information differently. Everything we do helps to build up a personal classifying system that will differ in some respect from somebody else's. So I see the sensory order as being an important issue that he needed to address for his critique of socialism. In 1954, Hayek tackled yet another field, history. It was widely believed that the Industrial Revolution had impoverished vast numbers of British citizens. Hayek challenged that claim in his introduction to Capitalism and the Historians, a collection of essays by leading scholars. For Hayek, the Industrial Revolution was an example of spontaneous order in action. Vast unplanned changes in the economy were the result of an untold number of individual economic decisions based on subjective values. Hayek believed that an impartial evaluation of the evidence would show that living standards actually improved with industrialization, contrary to the sentimental views of historians who romanticized the pre-industrial age of agriculture. Hayek was now ready for his most ambitious work to date. In 1955, he visited Cairo, where he lectured on the rule of law. These lectures formed the basis for what some consider his best work, The Constitution of Liberty, published in 1960. I would think the book, The Constitution of Liberty, is the modern compendium of liberal ideas. Nowhere is the importance of a free society for our civilization as well stated as in this book. The Constitution of Liberty is surely the most important work that was written in this and the past century and, one can likely say, the most important work since John Stuart Mill. The Constitution of Liberty recasts the long-standing ideas of classical liberalism in modern terms. Hayek concludes the Constitution of Liberty with the word, words that John Stuart Mill used to preface his work on liberty a century, defo uh, on liberty a century before, that the, the grand leading principle toward uh, which every uh, page in this book leads is the promotion of human diversity and its richest potential. According to Hayek, the role of the state is to ensure freedom and human progress through the rule of law. In making this claim, he was careful to define what law is not. We call now law a great many things which are not law in my sense. It is not the will of the rulers. Uh, which is governing the society, but the metaphysical doctrines behind the law, which is regu uh, regulating our daily lives. We can't make law. We can only, in we can only discover laws. For Hayek, law, properly understood, is based on precedent a system of trial and error in which the most effective social principles are passed down from one generation to the next. He saw some of the great traditions of the Anglo-American system to have evolved over generations in terms of principles such as fair play, justice, private property, contract. Many of society's most important laws or rules are not the products of conscious design, according to Hayek. A sort of cultural evolution passes along the most effective rules to be refined over time through custom, tradition, and experience. His theory of um, spontaneous orders is of extreme importance. 
language is a, is a spontaneous order. Nobody invented language. No authority ever set the rules for, for, for speaking or writing. Uh, Hayek uh, tells us that law is like that. We are living all the time thanks to a system of rules of conduct which we have not invented, which we have not designed, which we largely do not understand. People have tried out over the time different strategies to solve problems and they were able to learn which kind of generalized strategies work better than others. And these experiences they have condensed in rules. These rules of course are interpreted by our parents, our, our, so, our, our uh, uh, authorities, they're interpreted by those with whom we interact, so they do change gradually, but nevertheless these rules are, are not of our own making. It's law that creates freedom by creating a rational framework within which individuals can lead their life. So I think that Hayek's underlying idea in political philosophy is that liberty is the supremacy of law. Hayek's understanding of the rule of law involved two critical points. The first was that society's rules must be general. They must not become specific centralized commands. This also keeps them from becoming instruments for granting special privileges. True freedom implies equality under the law. An open society in which I can deal with any person I encounter presupposes that certain basic rules are enforced on everybody within their territory. Hayek was concerned about how democratic governments fail to safeguard this principle by confusing law with legislation. Legislation, in a strict sense, ought to be confined to general rules, but what we now call legislation are largely orders, commands issued to particular groups, granting privileges to some and uh, imposing special duties on others. Hayek's second point about the rule of law was that laws should tell individuals only what they could not do in order to prevent harm to others. Laws should not tell individuals what they must do. These rules, and this is the characteristic of general rules, they tell people what strategies they are not allowed to employ in their efforts to improve their own situation. But within the remainder of the open space of conceivable actions, they are free to choose whatever they consider most appropriate and more conducive to their interests. Hayek did grant that government might need to guarantee a minimum set of specific protections in areas such as health care, the environment, and disaster relief. But he argued these should be privatized whenever possible. The Constitution of Liberty has taken its place among the great works of classical liberal theory. Such an immense scholarship I have never before discovered. That is absolutely surpassing. And uh, the uh, ideas there, especially the ideas about the, the justice problem, about the problem of spontaneous interaction of 10,000s of people, all of them having completely different value convictions, and how we can find people or we can find um, ways and means to make people with completely different value convictions to live together in more or less um, peace and freedom, is, that was something what still fascinates me. That is actually, for me, the quintessence of economics. In the early 1960s, Hayek unexpectedly received an invitation to teach in Freiburg, West Germany. Freiburg was the professional home of his old friend and Mont Pelerin Society member, Walter Eucken, who had died in 1950. Ludwig Erhardt, another Mont Pelerin Society member, was soon to become chancellor of West Germany. After moving to Freiburg, Hayek pressed on with the development of his ideas on spontaneous order. By 1969, he had almost completed the first volume of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. This work, which he planned to publish in three volumes, was to expand on the concerns he had addressed in the Constitution of Liberty. In the Constitution of Liberty, I was still mainly 
attempting to restate for our time what I regarded as traditional principles. I wanted to explain what 19th century liberalism had really intended to do. It was only at the time when I practically finished the book that I discovered that uh, 19th century liberalism had no answers to certain questions. Law, legislation, and liberty was eventually to be a work of sweeping scope and substantial importance. But before the first volume was finished, Hayek began to suffer from a severe depression. Years of standing against the academic and political mainstream were apparently taking their toll. Even after he finally finished the first volume in 1973, Hayek's outlook had not improved. And Hayek was feeling so low that he was literally unable to get up from his bed. And when he talked to uh, Arthur Selden, he'd, he told him that at that time he felt that his entire life's work had been a waste. Then in 1974, very unexpectedly, Hayek was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Ironically, his co-recipient was Gunnar Myrtle, a socialist thinker from Sweden. The Nobel Prize led to a swift reversal in Hayek's reputation. As one writer noted, he quickly went from goofball to guru. It also seemed to spark a burst of energy within Hayek, resulting in renewed health and a dramatically increased intellectual output. He'd say, no, it wasn't the Nobel Prize, and I, uh, but the Nobel Prize was a tremendous shot in the arm. In 1976, Hayek completed Volume 2 of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. When news of its completion was delivered to a meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, cheering erupted. Three years later, in 1979, the last of the three volumes was published. I thought very highly of uh, Road to Serfdom, I knew how important uh, it had been historically, but uh, law legislation and liberty uh, was, was uh, a revelation. Hayek used one volume each for what he termed three fundamental insights on the preservation of a society of free individuals. The first of Hayek's three insights was order without commands. This was a further clarification of his concept of spontaneous order. Hayek persisted in combating the misperception that order is equivalent to a single overarching vision or plan. He argued that order occurs spontaneously in society because all of the plans of individuals are coordinated through various mechanisms that transmit information such as market prices, customary practices, values, language, and tradition. It is very exciting to transpose what one thinks of as a vast network of operations of people exchanging money and goods, mm. uh, suddenly to discover that this really has a totally different aspect altogether. And I think that's a brilliant illumination. Hayek's second insight addressed the concept of social justice. For Hayek, the term social justice was without any clear meaning and could be used simply to dress up the political bias of the user. As a standard by which to judge the economy, it was at best useless and at worst harmful, since it obscured the real nature of both justice and social order. Any deliberate attempt to correct the distribution according to supposed principles of social justice are ultimately irreconcilable with a free society. Hayek believed in what he considered true justice, which sprang from the genuine equality of individuals under the rule of law. Distributive equality was another matter. True justice is impartial and impersonal. Differing conditions among individuals and groups which are not the result of interference do not imply a lack of social justice. It's not facts which are fair, it's human action which is fair or just. And to apply the concept of justice, which is an attribute of human action, to a state of affairs which has not been deliberately brought about by anybody, is just nonsense. The third of Hayek's trilogy of insights was that democracy did not necessarily equate to liberty. Confusing democracy with liberalism was, for him, a tragic illusion. Far more important was a constitutional order that would limit the power of government to interfere with the spontaneous order of society. 
To the degree that democracy holds government officials accountable for their actions, it is an essential part of a functioning political order. By itself, however, democracy is not a sufficient protection for freedom. That, of course, is no longer the will of the majority, or the opinion of the majority, I prefer to say, which uh, determines what the government does, but the government is forced to satisfy all kinds of special interests in order to build up a majority. It's in the process. There's not a majority which agrees, but the problem of building up a majority by satisfying particular groups. In the late 1970s, the world was entering a new era, and Hayek's ideas were beginning to have an influence. The simultaneous high inflation and high unemployment, which seemed to be the legacy of Keynesian economics, caused many to begin looking for other answers. In England, Margaret Thatcher was turning the British economy around, largely through reliance on Hayek's theories. Hayek had great admiration for Mrs. Thatcher. Her adoption of his concepts caused some to call Hayek her mad professor. Once she pulled the Constitution of Liberty out of her bag, placed it on the table, and said, this is our program. And then extraordinary changes happened in England. In the 1980s, an economic sea change occurred in the United States. Ronald Reagan had come to office with a new approach based in part on Hayek's ideas. Reagan's administration would bring both inflation and unemployment under control. In 1982, Hayek was awarded the Order of Merit by the Austrian government, and in 1984, he became a Companion of Honor, a personal award from the Queen of England. Hayek's final book, The Fatal Conceit, was published in 1988. In it, Hayek warned his readers against the temptation to assume that social institutions and inherited practices can simply be altered or abolished to suit the momentary objectives of would-be reformers. In 1989, at the age of 90, Friedrich Hayek witnessed the dismantling of the Berlin Wall, the victim of unworkable government economic planning and increasing pressure for freedom. This was the first step on the road away from serfdom and the ultimate affirmation of Hayek's ideas about the nature of order in human society. If you were a good Hayekian, it should have been inevitable that communism was going to fall because it should have been inevitable that this terribly inefficient system was going to at some point just grind to a crashing halt. And nowhere is Hayek as popular and as well respected as in the East European countries because those people have seen his uh, theories, his, uh, they have read The Road to Serfdom, which gives an accurate uh, account of, of, the, of, the, of the police states and uh, of the conditions uh, under, under which centralist economic planning uh, ca can be performed. And they also see the great promise that he holds out uh, for them. President George Bush presented the U.S. Medal of Freedom to Hayek in 1991. Hayek's son, Dr. Lawrence Hayek, accepted. Friedrich August von Hayek died in 1992. His life had essentially come full circle through two distinct half-centuries in which his reputation had risen, then fallen, and finally risen again even more strongly. He had seen the ideas of free markets and human liberty go from ridicule to being the centerpiece of social thought. This is Hayek's legacy. I think that we can divide the 20th century into four quarters. The first quarter was dominated by Lenin and the Russian Revolution. The second quarter by Hitler, National Socialism and the World War. The third quarter was dominated by Keynesian thinking. It was really the quarter of Keynes. But the fourth quarter of the 20th century was characterized and dominated in some ways by Hayek. I think that Hayek will be perceived in retrospect as the greatest political philosopher of the 20th century. Hayek, I regard, for, as a man for all times. <laughs>